Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning. Uh, good evening. My name is Alan McHale. I am um, um, chair of the history department here at Yale, a member of the council, and it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you uh, to uh, the CMES um, uh, lecture series in which we'll, we will, you will be discussing this fabulous new book by our distinguished guest, Sarah Stein. Um, just to run through how this conversation is going to go, I'm going to introduce um, Sarah and uh, my colleague, Maury Samuels. Um, Sarah will then uh, read a short excerpt from her book. Uh, then Maury and I will um, um, be in conversation with Sarah for about 20, 25 minutes. And then around 1230, um, we will um, go to questions from the Q&A. So all of you have um, the ability to, to pose a question to Sarah or to Maury. Um, using the Q&A function in Zoom. And feel free to uh, post your question at any point during the conversation so that we'll have um, a set waiting for us um, once we, we, we move to the questions. You can post anonymously or with your name. Um, Sarah Stein is the um, uh, Viterbi Family um, um, Chair in Mediterranean Jewish Studies and Director of the Center of Jewish Studies at UCLA. She is uh, the uh, author and editor of nine books, most recently the subject of our conversation today, Family Papers, A Sephardic Journey Through the 20th Century. She's received numerous awards uh, for her uh, uh, publications and service to the profession over the course of her career. Um, Maury Samuels, our colleague um, here at Yale, um, is professor of French and also director of the Yale Program for the Study of Antisemitism, author most recently of um, um, a book um, entitled Betrayal, uh, The Betrayal of the Duchess. Um, so I, I, I want to afford us as much time as possible, so I'm going to stop there um, and, and turn the floor over uh, to Sarah um, um, to um, get us going with the reading from her book. Lovely. Thanks so much, Alan, and to everyone who had a hand in uh, inviting me to the um, CMES and to uh, Marwa and Kristen and uh, Maury and Alan and uh, Yasmin and Vish, thank you so much for all of your uh, assistance, your collegiality and, and your kindness with this invitation. So I thought I would read just um, a very short excerpt. I don't think readings translate so well to Zoom, but just the first page and a half or so of um, the book we'll be discussing, Family Papers, because I do think it offers a nice frame for us to begin with. This is the story of a single Sephardic family whose roots connect them to a place and community that no longer exist. The place was the port city of Ottoman Salonika, present day Thessaloniki, Greece, one of the few cities in modern Europe ever to claim a Jewish majority. The community was made up mostly of Ladino or Judeo-Spanish speaking Jews, Sephardic families who traced their ancestry back to Sepharad, medieval Iberia, from which they were expelled in the 1490s, but who for the next five centuries called the Ottoman Empire, Southeastern Europe and Salonika home. Today, the papers of the Levy family are spread across nine countries and three continents. The single largest collection, the papers of Leon Levy, is kept by his four grandchildren in a private vault in Rio de Janeiro. It consists of nearly 5,000 handwritten and typed letters, telegrams, postcards, legal and medical documents and miscellany, address books, expired passports, and more. By far the largest private archive I have encountered as a professional historian and near obsessive document hunter. In a suitcase in a spare garage in a retirement village outside Johannesburg, there is another repository of Levy family papers. Smaller than the Rio collection, the South African one is nonetheless of immeasurable historical value. It includes such cherished souvenirs as a silhouette cut in Salonika in 1919, capturing the likeness of a young woman about to emigrate from her native city, never to return. Other family papers have turned up in private hands in England. One collection boxed up in a home in London has survived multiple migrations from Greece to Great Britain, to Germany, to India, back to Great Britain and to the United States. Another housed in a scenic village outside Manchester contains fragile glass slides taken in 1917 in Salonika's Jewish cemetery, then the largest Jewish cemetery in Europe. Yet more documents, photographs and objects have materialized in Brazil, Canada, France, Germany, 
Great Britain, Greece, Hungary, Israel, Italy, Portugal, and the United States, not only family owned papers, but documents and photographs held by some 30 archives, travel documents, naturalization papers, birth certificates, death certificates, medical records, letters exchanged by relatives, lovers, and friends, business papers, even a baptismal certificate. All told, these scattered sources have allowed me to trace an intimate arc of the 20th century. The Levy family papers catalog the lives and losses of multiple generations, contain papers written in eight languages, and reflect correspondence among members of a single family spanning the globe. This is a Jewish story, an Ottoman story, a European story, a Mediterranean story, and a diasporic story, a story of how women, men, and children experienced war, genocide, and migration, the collapse of old regimes, and the rise of new nations, the Levy papers also reveal how this family loved and quarreled, struggled and succeeded, clung to one another, and watched the ties that once bound them slip from their grasp. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Um, I, I just thought this book was amazing. I mean, you're, you're ama the research is so incredible in the book. Um, but you also write with such a kind of light touch that it's really just an incredible read. Um, so I don't know, the people who've read it know what I'm talking about and you gave a sense of it um, now, but it's just so beautifully written and it reads like a, like a novel, one of those kind of sprawling Thank family you. novels. So I just, I really enjoyed it. So, okay, I'm eager to, I have a lot of questions uh, for you. The first one is really about the memoir that launched uh, the whole book. So the memoir by Sadi Alevi. Um, can you just tell us a little bit more about it? it you say you, you found it in the National yeah. Library of Israel. Um, you know, what did it help you see? And how, and sure, I'd be happy to. And um, as you know, we thought I might experiment with um, stringing some some images through the conversation. So we will see how, how well or not well this works. Um, but I believe right now you can see some images and I'll perhaps intersperse them as I, as I answer your questions, Maury. And thank you so much for the kind words. Um, so to tell about the memoir is a little bit to tell the origin story of the book itself, because I was working before this book um, uh, had published with my colleague and friend and, and former teacher, Aaron Rodrigue, a translation of this man's memoir. So this is Sadi Bissalel Ashkenazi Alevi, um, who was a um, newspaper editor in Salonika, um, a writer, a publisher, a singer, a composer, and a firebrand. And um, he composed a handwritten memoir, handwritten by a scribe, we think, dictated to a scribe. Um, over years of his life, possibly even decades of his life um, before his death. And it was Aaron, my colleague, um, who found this, and I found not only in the archival discovery of found, but actually it was miscatalogued. So it was, in a sense, uh, a lucky and accidental find in the catalogs of the um, Hebrew manuscript collection of the National Library of Israel. Um, now, historians knew this document existed. We knew that Saadi had written the memoir because his sons had published excerpts of it in French and in Ladino in newspapers in the 1920s and 1930s um, and had referenced it. So we, we knew there had been a memoir, but historians, the, the small coterie historians who knew of this suspected it had been lost. And it was a very exciting discovery because it was, um, we, we um, believe it is the first memoir to be written in Judeo-Spanish. Um, and the document written in Ottoman Salonika extraordinarily had its own amazing history um, because it traveled from Salonika uh, to Paris uh, we've, uh, and then from Paris to, to Rio before reaching Jerusalem where it would rest in, in the archives. And so as I was finishing this project, um, I became curious um, with the question of, what had become of the family and thinking about that journey that this very flimsy uh, memoir had traveled, um, I thought, could we use that journey to reconstruct the family's own journey? And so I began to sort of follow the, that uh, uh, memoir, just a, a, a thin notebook in reverse and trying to find the family uh, along these, these many pathways. And that, that curiosity, that kind of reverse journey um, 
opened up the, a, a, a much larger uh, research enterprise that you know took some decade to sort of wind its its way to completion. Yeah, amazing. So, so tell us a little bit more about um, this family, about the descendant, because the book is, you know, as you said, focused on the descendants of the um, Sadi Alevi. How representative would you say they are of Sephardic Jewry, of, you know, yeah, um, right. Salonican Jewry? Yeah, it's a question that I toy with a lot in the book. Um, because let me first tell you a little bit about them. I mean, so Saadi, Saadi's family was, um, you know, a family of letters. And because of his work with his sons as a newspaper editor and publisher, and, and they were, and writers, they were all writers, they became really crucial members of the cultural elite of Salonika in the mid to late 19th century and into the early 20th century. And one of Saadi's sons, David, who became known as um, Daoud Effendi, subsequently after um, Salonika became Greek, after the Balkan Wars, became the chancellor of the Jewish community of Greece, a position that he would maintain through the Second World War until his deportation. Um, well, actually he, he retired before that, but he would remain influential in the community until his deportation at the hands of the Nazis to Auschwitz where he would die. So the family was a family of um, letters teachers, journalists, writers, musicians. Um, they were not wealthy, although they were among the cultural elite, which is an interesting distinction. And some members of the family were among the rising bourgeoisie of Ottoman Salonika and subsequently of Greece, but other members of the family were um, pulled into poverty, um, especially in the interwar years when poverty affected so many in the Salonican milieu. Um, in these respects that I'm describing, they were unusual, they were distinctive, um, and they were culturally distinctive. And yet, in many ways, I would say their story tells an arc that is not only um, reflective of a larger Sephardic story, but also, I think, reflective of a larger Jewish story. Um, so that is to look at the at the broad generalities, the way they weather the transition from empires to nation states and wars and migration and struggles with assimilation and acculturation, um, the gradual um, diminishment of their attachment to Ladino, their native tongue, in all of you know, their experience of the Holocaust and all of these effects, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Jewish story, but it's really also very specifically Sephardic and I would say Ottoman um, carrying for many generations, but not to the present day, this profound cultural imprint of an Ottoman world. Um, so this is something in the book that I'm, I'm really trying to understand and play with. In what ways are they unusual? In what ways are they typical? Certainly when you drill down into a family history, what do you uncover? But a whole collection of black sheep, you know? I mean, and so in that, any family is sort of deliciously messy and atypical in, in their particularities. And, and those delighted and fascinated me and sometimes repulsed me too. Yeah, and, and I wanna to come to some of the uh, more repulsive characters because yeah. there's one uh, especially um, that I want, I want to talk about. But first, of, if you could say a little bit more about Salonika itself. So you say that it's, um, you know, it was the only city, I guess, in the world to have a Jewish um, plurality. Well, I say it's one of the, of the rare cities in the, yeah. um, in the Jewish world to have a Jewish majority, certainly in Europe. I mean, one can think of other Mediterranean cities that at various places in time, the city of Oran in Algeria, Aswira in Morocco, other examples um, that have a Jewish majority or plurality. But Salonika is um, incredibly distinctive that for a time, this is true, that the city is certainly, before it is Greek, it is more Jewish than it is Greek. Um, but it is, at, at the time of Saudi's writing, it is an influential Ottoman port, um, culturally diverse, Muslims, Christians, Jews, foreigners, um, it is a major Jewish entrepot um, with um, a lot of internal Jewish diversity. It's not just Jews of Iberian origin. It's Sephardic Jews, Romanio Jews, Italian Jews, Ashkenazi Jews, Jews whose families are internally mixed, um, as was this family, in fact. Um, and um, the, the family experiences so many astonishing transitions in a short period of time. 
um, the Balkan Wars, which uh, bring the city uh, with parts of the region under Greek control, which also brings violence and displacement to the region. The First World War with its allied bombardments, huge numbers of troops stationed there, um, a great fire in 1917, which decimates the geographic center of the city and also the Jewish center of the city and all kinds of Jewish um, buildings, institutions, uh, synagogues, schools, community buildings, um, Torah scrolls, libraries, displaces many, many thousands of Jews, Muslims and Christians. And then the Second World War, all of this happens, you know, so, and the population transfers as well. Um, all of this happens in such a dense period of time. And so what the family and the city are experiencing is um, a complete transformation, not only in the urban landscape, um, the demographic makeup of the city, but also more specifically to this family with the place of Jews in the cultural fabric of the, of the city. It's, it is changing and they are becoming demographically less significant. They are geographically being displaced. And with the rise of Greek nationalism, um, there is a rise in anti-Semitism, although there are many Jews, including Jews in this family, who wed themselves to the new Greek regime and throw in their lot with the Greek state. Um, and and um, I mentioned Daoud Fendi, who becomes the head of the Jewish community, who also is a, um, a public employee. Mm -hmm. um, so that gives you a sense of, of transition. And then accompanying all of these changes that are really only lasting from, you know, 1911, let's say, to, um, to the early 40s, it's such a, it's less than a lifetime. Um, you also have massive emigration. And um, of course, with the Second World War, um, genocide and the annihilation of, of the community. Yeah, so, so if you could say a little bit more about the fate of this family and really about um, the fate of Salonican Jews during the Holocaust. We think of the Holocaust as really a tragedy affecting Ashkenazic Jews, but um, it, it almost totally wiped out the Salonican Jews, right? So it does, it does. So um, rates of annihilation in Greece in general and in the city of Salonika, Thessaloniki in particular are among the highest anywhere in Europe, 97% destruction rates. Um, and um, it is true that I would say until recently, um, the story of Sephardic Jews has been really uh, systematically erased from Holocaust history, but fortunately, I think the tide has begun to turn with scholarly and popular writing on the subject and, um, and memoirs and museum exhibits and um, a shift in attention of major um, sites of memorialization and, uh, and memory, including museums. Um, but it, this community is indeed just catastrophically devastated by the war. And the war is very punishing on Greece. There is massive starvation. Um, it is uh, an, an incredibly traumatic period of occupation following you know, on the heels of, of other forms of violence and, and ending um, after its end, moving into a, a civil war. So this, it is just such a painful chapter um, of this community's history, this family's history, and the city's history that um, I, I'm glad is the wrong word given the topic, but I'm relieved to say that this book joins other works in really um, reassessing the timeline and the geography of the Holocaust to encompass the experience of, of Salonika and other Sephardic centers. Mm -hmm. And what about um, uh, the anti-Semitism. I mean, you, you say in the book that um, anti-Semitism increased after Greek con and Christian control of the city. So could you talk a little bit about like what changed exactly and what, you know, relations were like among Christians, Muslims, <coughs> excuse me, Muslims and Jews in the Ottoman period versus after Greek control? Um, well, um, one doesn't want to romanticize uh, the the Ottoman the late Ottoman era as a, as an era of tolerance and of course um, Ottoman historians have debated this this matter quite endlessly and and spent a lot of ink on this this subject but I would say that for Jews for the most part there is um, this strong affinity for empire this is um, I'm inspired of course by the work of Julia Phillips Cohen and and others on this topic a strong affinity for empire 
that is born um, in, in great part because of um, legal opportunities, uh, religious forms of independence, um, economic independence that arises from um, the legal way in which the Jewish community is, is treated by the Ottoman state. Obviously it, it is not so friendly to all, all groups and Armenian Christians do not experience um, such favor. Um, but for the Sephardic Jews of the empire, and now I'm really speaking about the Southeastern European Judeo-Spanish speaking community in particular, there is this fidelity to empire. And even as in the late 19th century and early 20th century, um, there is an explosion of Jewish political sentiment across a, a wide spectrum from Ottoman um, fealty, Ottomanism, to socialism, to communism, to Jewish nationalism, Zionism, um, and, and other stops in between. While this is all happening, there, there remains an abiding, I would say, sense of connection to place and polity. Um, and many Jews are fearful, and it turns out that they are fairly fearful. They are fearful of the dissolution of the empire because they see that the rise of nation states in various places is accompanied by um, uh, hostility to minority populations, not just Jews, but other minority populations. And it this does bear itself out indeed. Um, now, Devin Nahr, um, my colleague and friend who has written on Jewish Salonika has done a wonderful job of dismantling this um, dismantling the supposition um, that one goes from, you know, fine fortune to poor fortune with the transition to the Greek rule. And he has written very compellingly about how many Jews um, do become allies of the Greek state and proponents of the Greek state and Greek nationalists. But still, at least in the early years after transition, early decades, there is, um, Jews are watching in Salonika um, laws and policies be shaped that are attempting to marginalize the Jewish and the Muslim population to demographically begin to um, lessen or erase their presence, which of course for Muslims culminates with the population transfers, um, but also physically to change the cityscape so that they are less visible, less prominent, less a symbol of the city. Um, and this can be something as banal as the changing of street names, which really isn't banal at all, um, or the transformation of, of mosques into Christian sites of um, worship. Um, but it can also work its way out through economic policies, for example, mandating that, sap that Sunday is the official day of rest. Well, if Sunday is the official day of rest, what are you doing? You're forcing Jews to make that choice to either take two days of rest, which could be economically crippling, or to work on, on the Sabbath. So these are examples of ways in which Jews experience this transition practically in their everyday lives. And, um, and so while I don't want to undermine the importance of like Devin Nahr's argument that this transition from empire to state is, is not um, unambiguously um, fraught, I, I, it is evident that the family begins to worry about their place, their community's place in a city that they have known as home for so many um, generations. And my emigration does start to rise at this time. And not only emigration, but the search for legal pathways out, including the acquisition of foreign passports, which um, some of them do pursue. Uh -huh. And Can I jump uh, in here, Maury? Yeah, Please. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted, and this is this is fascinating and wonderful. I wanted, I wanted maybe to shift to a kind of historian's craft question. Um, you know, just just speaking about the, these enormous dislocations of, of, of the first part of the 20th century, the end of the 19th century, and the first part of the 20th century, I, I'm struck also that you, you know your, your book is very. It, I mean, it's it's structured around individuals um, uh, that are a part of this sprawling family. So, how do you both empirically, in terms of placing the letters that you have in the the, the sort of waves of dislocations that we've been discussing? deal with that question of scale and then also as a as a as a writerly historian how do you how do you how do you balance that in in your narrative uh thank you i mean i um much of my writing before this book i would say has been extremely argument driven um driven by theoretical interventions and by argumentative interventions and with this project i thought that the family story um, and the sources lent themselves to a broader 
a narratively driven account that I thought opened up Sephardic history to a wider array of, um, of readers. And as part of that determination, I, I thought um, very deeply about, about structure and framing uh, and storytelling. And I, I made the decision um, to organize the book for folks who haven't peeked at it yet, um, such that each chapter is a person. Um, and they, the book moves forward chronologically and thematically through the stories of individuals. And um, most of these characters so-called in the book appear more than once through the course of their lives, but some for unusual reasons appear only once. Um, and that narrative conceit um, allowed me to take some of the macro issues that Maury and I were talking about a moment ago, these very grandiose questions of empire and, and violence and uh, political identity and belonging um, and uh, the kind of political arc of the 20th, late 19th and 20th century, allowed me to bring those down to a human scale. And that was really my goal, was to think about them not abstractly, but think about them as they were lived and experienced by women, men, children, family members, and a family as a whole. Um, and it was really a narrative challenge because um, I, I'm enough of a historian and not enough of a fiction a writer of fiction that I wanted the story to continue moving along chronologically, although it's a little jagged. And that meant that I had to choose very carefully who would be included to to kind of speak for what historical moment and how I would fill in historical moments when the family records themselves were quite silent. Um, and I would say uh, it also um, pushed me to um, dwell on certain sources that um, uh, represented moments that were that were less archivally populated for the family, um, allowed certain sources to kind of breathe larger. So it might be that for one moment, a single paper, a single document, a single letter looms very large, whereas for another one, I'm, I'm sifting through, synthesizing, you know, bouncing between thousands and thousands of documents. Um, so that narrative decision was really, um, that narrative will, first that I wanted to write in a broad way was very determinative for not only structure, but also my relationship to sources and, and the characters that I was trying to develop through them. And speaking of characters, I had kind of mentioned before that one of the you know, most shocking and dramatic parts of the book is you, you, know, you discover that one of the relatives, one of the descendants um, collaborated with the Nazis. So, um, and this is something that you say was not actually found in the papers of the Correct. family. They don't mention this. So could you say a little bit more like what the story is and how you found out about it? Um, yes, well, um, I, I, this is a very dramatic story, but I think historians will also, students of history out there will recognize that there's a kind of broader lesson about what we see and what we don't see, what we find and what we don't find in sources. So, um, I did indeed determine that uh, a member of the family was the head of the Jewish police in Salonika uh, and served the Nazis and abetted the deportation of Jews from Salonika, was a um, notorious sadist and his crimes and violence and um, evil really uh, seemed to know almost no bounds. Um, uh, most of my information about this, much of my information about this was gleaned from the records of his trial. He is tried after the war, after a very dramatic story of multiple escapes and evasion of the authorities. He is tried by the Greek state at the behest of the Jewish community, tried um, for complicity with the Nazis. And he is found guilty, and I hope I'm not giving away too much, but he is, as it turns out, the only Jew to be executed by a state after the war for complicity with the Nazis. So in terms of black sheep, this is, this is a serious one. Um, and the story was uh, intentionally erased from family correspondence and his name was erased from family trees, multiple family trees that I found. 
And no living member of the family who I spoke to, and I spoke to many, knew of his existence, appeared to know of his existence until the publication of, of the book. Um, the trial records that I found, they, there's a copy in the archive of the Jewish Museum of Thessaloniki, and there's a duplicate copy at the Holocaust Museum in DC. There was a different copy um, at uh, the wider library in London, which unfortunately was somehow lost. The library can't locate it, but was cited by um, earlier scholarship very briefly. Um, so this story had been at first actively suppressed by the family, and then um, they succeeded really in erasing it from the family record. And the family letters never mentioned him by name, but once I understood about his history and about his trial, I of course reread everything and realized that although they didn't mention him, it this trauma informed family relations for years, for decades um, during and after the war. But they were very, although these were private letters and they never had any intention of donating them and they haven't been donated. Most of, mostly they're still in family hands, but they didn't want to put this in writing. Uh, and there's another story to be told about his daughter whom um, I located, who was very young during the war and when she escaped with her father. Um, but that's perhaps for, for another time. So maybe um, we should turn to a couple questions. Um, we, we've gotten some from the audience. I'd encourage um, people again to uh, populate the Q&A um, uh, function with your questions. Um, we have a question here from Barbara Katz. Um, she writes, my father was born in Salonika in 1910. He was a barber with four brothers, married with two young daughters. He was, one, he was on one of the last transports on August 13, 1943, along with his brother, my uncle. Both survived through Auschwitz, the Warsaw Ghetto, and Dachau to settle in Boston because it was, quote, near New York, where their half-brother had lived since World War I. Um, she says, I found very little about the Jews of Greece in the Holocaust, but what, uh, what scholarship is out there, um, if any, about the Greek survivors? Yes. Um... Mm -hmm. um, well, right. So uh, there is um, a scholarship about the Greek survivors. It's interesting because there is a, a book manuscript now on precisely this question of the survivor community and the, the, the fate of that will hopefully find um, uh, be, be wonderful because it's an insightful book. There, there are some, um, I would say that in general, we need more on this topic. And um, Barbara, I think that you're right in saying if your investigations have found there to be not a satisfying amount of scholarship, you're, you're not wrong in that. Um, you know, it's a story that is touched upon in writing by Devin Narr, by Katie Fleming, um, by uh, Minna Rosen um, and, and others. Um, uh, there's a wonderful piece by um, uh, Katerina, um, I'm forgetting her name, Katerina, uh, I'll tell you because I too, I do, don't want to get it, ra get it wrong, but um, uh, there's a wonderful new book in, uh, in writing by Katerina Ka Karlova um, on the post-war community and especially how they navigate um, reparations um, in, in various edited volumes, which I would why I warmly recommend. Some of her writing is um, published in German as well. Um, but I but I think that it it is a lesser developed field than it ought to be. And I think this has much to do with the way in which the Sephardic story has, I won't say been erased from Holocaust history, but been subdued. Um, and this also extends to questions of testimony. Um, while there are testimonies, and I would be curious um, to know what the family name is of, of your father's testimony in the Fortunoff archives, but there are testimonies to be found in various collections of testimonies, Yad Vashem and um, the, the Shoah collection at USC and Fortunoff at, at Yale and, and others. Um, in many cases, these testimonies haven't been utilized as much as testimonies from sort of the major Ashkenazi communities and centers. Um, that are that receive more attention. So I sympathize with the the sort of impulse of the of the of the query, which is that we we wish we need to know more. 
Okay, thank you. Um, another question from David Koslow. Um, could you describe the circumstances that allowed for the preservation of these documents? And then also, um, could you could you speak to any appearances of Yiddish in in the universe of these documents? Okay, um, so um, the documents, a portion of the documents I used, the biggest portion, are in family hands, um, boxes, um, vaults, uh, folders, um, piles. Um, under beds, in attics. I mean, we, we've, many of us who work on family histories have seen this before. The families have stewarded these papers and documents very lovingly. Um, professional archivists would not, would recoil at the conditions. But I think the point I wanna make is that they have saved them. They understand that they are valuable, even though in most cases they can't read the languages they're written in. Um, I had to supplement those materials because there are holes. For example, the hole around Vital Hassan, the war criminal. Um, and so um, I also consulted um, a, a few, two dozen or more um, professional archives to fill in the stories that the paper, the family papers themselves did not tell. Um, but I think there's a number of complicated lessons to be learned here. And, and one of them has to do with the longstanding disinterest, if I am to be frank, of archives and institutions in systematically collecting documents of the Mediterranean and Middle Eastern Jewish past. And also the fact that in some cases, this is very fraught. This is less tr true for Salonika, but it's certainly true for the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, the question of who really has the right to own and steward these materials, but not stepping into that domain right now, I would say that there has been um, a disinterest, disinclination, um, lack of imagination in collecting these materials. So it is, I think, often more likely that you find Sephardic familial papers less often in institutional archives and more often in the private hands. Um, so the fact that they saved it wasn't just a personal quirk. It wasn't just that they came from a family of letters and, and valued letters. It was also that um, you know, people haven't come knocking in the way that they have come knocking for um, documents of Jewish Eastern Europe, let us say. Um, now, in terms of Yiddish, um, I do conduct research in Yiddish, but, and I have been surprised through the course of my research how Yiddish does come in surprisingly handy from time to time, but with this family history, it, it never appeared. There was no reason um, it would be utilized. Um, there, was, there was no source in Yiddish um, brought me insight on this history. Um, I, if I can dive back in, um, I was really struck at the end when you said that the, um, the family uh, no longer is really in touch. Like the different branches don't really have right. any, an interest in being in touch with each other. Why is that? I mean, I, I was shocked by it. And yeah. Is that typical of the right. Sephardic diaspora in general? Um, well, so there's a little bit of a plot twist around this and it might be fun to just again, um, open up the some images that I have. Um, so this is a picture that I took in the course of my research uh, in Rio de Janeiro of two generations of the family who um, uh, who kindly welcomed me into their homes and shared documents and, and personal memories and uh, whose whose history I write. Um, and the can woman I just, on who did, yeah. language did you speak to them in? Um, this conversation was in English, and amazingly, the woman on the far right, who um, alas passed away in the course of my research, had um, grown up in, I think she was a left Salonica when she was very young and had gone to an English language school. So her English was impeccable, as was that of, of her daughter and niece. Um, but here they are looking at my computer at the wedding invitation of the woman on the far right, a wedding invitation, if I remember it correctly, from like 1911. Um, while I was researching the book, I was surprised and intrigued by the fact that I would meet these members of the family and I would drop hints that I had, was of course finding their relatives all around the globe. I would say something like, oh, as it happens, I was just emailing with this distant cousin of yours in Johannesburg or something like this. 
And I kept waiting to be asked for them to ask me to put them in touch with one another. And they never did. And it really, I, I found that fascinating and interesting and surprising, but it, it wasn't my choice to be made. So um, I didn't uh, aggressively introduce anyone to, to, one, to one another. And I thought that was the story. And that is the story I end with in the book by saying, it's so interesting that they no longer um, view themselves as family after all of these generations and the tide of history and languages have pulled them apart and sort of politics and religion and many other things. But then um, last, uh, just under pandemic, the family um, orchestrated a Zoom reunion of some 40 members of the family um, in I think it was six countries, four continents. And they were, these are all people who didn't know each other before, didn't know each other and didn't know of each other's existence before the publication of the book. Um, and they were so thrilled to be in contact. Um, and many people on the Zoom call said that they had come to understand themselves as family and that they were eager for the in-person post-pandemic reunion to take place. So there was one story that emerged, I think, during my research. And then there was another story that emerged after the publication of the book, which um, really has delighted me to think that perhaps by telling this history, um, in some way, I've actually sort of put that course of that family back on a, a kind of unified track, which I don't think that, you know, they might have found each other through DNA testing, but they didn't. Or maybe they could, they wouldn't. I'm not quite sure about that. But um, but it clearly was the nature, the book, that maybe the nature of the book, maybe their relationship to me, I'm not quite sure, maybe the moment um, collided to, to bring them together again. Yeah, that's amazing. And could you just say a little bit more about how you tracked them down? Because like to track down a family named Levy is, is yes. not easy. You know, it's, it's like it's the Jones of Jewish names, you know? So like, how did you... Um... Um, well, Oh my goodness. I mean, each branch has its own story. Um, there is one very helpful thing, which is Sephardic families have a tradition of naming after the living and these uh, unusual family names persisted through the generations, um, but, but not always. Um, I did hit some dead ends. There were, there were branches of the family that I, I couldn't, that ended for me at a certain point and people I couldn't find. And there were some people who emerged after the book was published and I thought, oh, if only I had found them before because they had extraordinary stories and documents that would have pushed the book in other directions. But th that is the lament of the historian that you know one, one could of course go on forever. Um, so in every case, it was a different mode of experimentation. And sometimes it had to do with a, a, a clever trick of the trade and sometimes it was absolute chance you know somebody um at one point somebody emerged who was close childhood friends with someone the descendant of someone who had gone to Portugal who managed to reconnect me with the family and opened up a whole history um one person the daughter of uh, Vital Hassan I spent three years looking for hard I mean I really I was really driven to find her. I, I wanted so much to see the history through her eyes. That and was like the saddest part of the book for me. It's a very sad. Yeah, it's very like what sad. happened to her and how she was kind of raised in these orphanages and then like just doesn't, you know, is sort of brought to, you know, goes to Israel, but is just very disconnected from, I, it was really. Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting because um, it is very sad. And yet she does not view her history as a sad history. Mm -hmm. And she does not view herself through the lens of suffering and loss. And um, did she, she know the, the full story of her father before your book? Um, she told me that she did not know anything about her father. Wow. Um, and that is quite possibly so. Um, but these are very painful things to know. And um, um, it's hard for me to to know what is known and what is not known. But um, but she had lived with her mother, who um, was also tried for complicity with the Nazis, but found not guilty. Um, she had lived with her mother until her mother passed away, only a few years before I located her. Um, 
so, you know, one this this goes well beyond what a historian is trained to discern, I would say. But but it was it was a, it's a very sad story, but it also was incredibly methodologically challenging to um, and I know there are many people who deal with oral history of survivors of trauma uh, and violence and um, um, you know delicate political entanglements. And um, I'm not the first to have to struggle with the question of how to handle material like that mm -hmm. on the one hand, and also a relationship like that on the other. But it's another moment where I don't know that any sort of professional training I had um, left me feeling as if I, as if there was an easy answer. Mm -hmm. And, and what about like, could you just talk about like how hard it was the writing of the book itself? Because it's really like, you know, a biography of an entire family and you so expertly weave these different characters together and their stories, but it must've been just very challenging to avoid like repeating story, like how, how you did that. Uh, just some of the methods. Well, thank you. I mean, I, um, as with any historical, pro as with any writerly project, um, Maury, you're no stranger to this, Alan, you're no stranger to this. You, you have to um, be prepared to, there's a lot that ends up on the cutting room floor and you have to make narrative choices. It's not obvious what's essential and what's not essential or who's important or who's not important. These are all narrative choices. Um, and so there was of course experimentation um, in it was very difficult to connect the dots. And, and I spent, um, I would say a long dark year, except I live in Santa Monica, so I can't claim to have experienced a long dark winter doing this. But you know, it, there, was a there was a lot of months of reading without connecting the pieces. And I would say to graduate students who, who might be on the call, who are engaged in dissertation research, sometimes you have to read and read and read and accept that you are confused and that you're going to have to reread and reread and reread once you understand something, you understand who someone is, you understand how someone's related, you understand what happened. And then you can go back and reread your notes or reread the originals again and make those connections. So I think it was um, the patience required of um, losing myself in the sources and accepting all that I didn't know and slowly, slowly, slowly acquainting myself with the characters and the timeline and the history and then being able to make connections across, let's say archives, across family collections, across pe uh, people that um, allowed me to kind of retell individual correspondences as family histories, as, as individual histories. And I think in that, it is a family history, but actually in that, it's not so very different than writing any kind of history, whether it's an economic history, a legal history or a political history, ultimately, you do have to kind of lose yourself in the story until you, you know, become lost in order to have insight and then set out again as a writer to think about how you translate that into some sort of acceptable, palatable, narrativized form. Mm -hmm. Sarah, could I also maybe ask a related question sure. about, um, you know, the very final pages of the book, you, you have a, you know, very illuminating discussion of the written word. Um, I, I wonder if you could offer us your thoughts on, we often hear about the pluses and minuses of um, you know, electronic communication, the fact that people are writing letters less. You, you spoke very briefly about uh, genealogical sciences and, and their, um, again, advantages and disadvantages for, for maybe thinking about some of these questions. Could you just maybe reflect on that for us a bit? Well, we're such a loquacious, this is such a loquacious time. I mean, people are writing all the time, but, and, but, but much of what we're writing is short and fast and uh, impulsive. Now, I don't want to demean the complexity of social media communication or uh, text generation, or I think, there's a lot of meaning being exchanged, you know, a lot of communication and, and um, messaging, connecting people today, um, maybe more than ever under pandemic, because um, we are, are losing out on those in-person moments that can fill um, a thirst, a need for sort of human contact. So I, I don't wanna tell 
a lacrimose story of um, soullessness in, in human contact. At the same time, reading the letters this family exchanged over a century, I do think there is something unique in that genre. These are documents that people sometimes sat and wrote over days, sometimes even weeks, waited for over weeks to receive. Um, there are um, letters that have been written and rewritten, I know because some of them, some of these writers saved their drafts. There are letters that are stained with tears. Um, these were documents that people really troubled over. Um, and when they received them, especially because we're talking about a globally diasporic family corresponding over you know, thousands of miles and borders um, and, and continents and hemispheres, they treasured these letters so much when they received them. And when they waited for them or when what letters went missing, which they inevitably did, they mourned them. Um, so all of this leads me to feel as if there, wa there was something different and unique about the handwritten letter um, and um, that, that is lost. And I'll say just like by digression there that, that that's really kind of um, intriguing that the family, when they send postcards, which they sometimes do, or when they send, when they make a, they convert to typed letters, they express shame and they apologize. I'm so sorry I'm writing you a postcard. I'm so sorry I have to use a typewriter, but su such and such, I wanna make a mimeograph copy, like, but I'm so sorry. Because they see it as less intimate. Uh, and one person in particular I remember is outraged every time he gets a postcard. He's like, oh, damn that person. You know, why can't they write me a letter? Why do they have to just send me a postcard? So the, I do think that something is lost with that transition away from, from the letter, whether, whether I'm not a purist about handwriting because no one can read my own, but um, something is lost. It is a different genre of communication uh, that I think that whose lack we suffer from. And out of curiosity, if I can ask, how long did the family keep speaking to each other and writing in Ladino, like until when? I assume. Yeah, that's a good question. I would say the last the last letter in Ladino that's saved by the family is a post war, post World War II letter. But that is a unique circumstance where um, somebody is. It's very, it's very tragic, but the, the family in Rio, the son who goes to Rio um, watches the Holocaust unfold from afar. And he writes to other family members that he's staying abreast of all the news, but he obviously can't possibly know the scale of the destruction or the nature of the, of the destruction. And he, there are things he simply doesn't, cannot wrap his mind around. He doesn't know, but he also cannot believe, for example, that the cemetery of Salonika has been, um, has been destroyed. Um, he cannot believe that he cannot retrieve his father's body for burial. He wants so desperately to go to Europe, even in 1945, 46, he wants to go to find his father's body. Uh, he, he was killed in Auschwitz. He cannot believe that this is not possible. And his father, if I can just say, is Daoud Effendi. His father is Daoud very Effendi. High, you know, the head of the- Yes, the yes, Jewish once community. an Ottoman official, yeah. then the head of the Jewish community, interwar Salonika, and, and then annihilated in Auschwitz. Um, so now I distracted myself from your question. The language was, about Ladino. Language. So there is a post-war letter in Ladino, but it it has to do with this pursuit for the father's body. And I wonder if they use Ladino um, partly because of the how very intimate that the subject matter was. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, I would say the last letters in Ladino are probably from the early 30s. And um, I should say that when they write in Ladino, they uh, romanize the Ladino. They don't use Rashi script or Salatreo, although some of them knew Salatreo for professor. Salatreo is the cur cursive form of Ladino. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that phases out very early in the family history. But the letters that said about the eradication of, of Ladino, that said, the letters are internally multilingual all the way to the 1970s. Um, and it's very complicated, the multilingual fabric of these letters, especially for the pre-World War II period, it's so complicated. So you might have a French letter and you would have a blessing in Hebrew in the letter, um, a term of endearment in Ladino, 
and financial matters discussed in Ottoman Turkish in that one letter. So is it French? Is it even French? You know, what is that letter? It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's Sephardic is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, although that's obviously not a language. Um, so that, that the linguistic narrative here is, is very complex. Sarah, there's a question here about um, if uh, you recorded interviews and if they're going to be placed in an oral history archive. Oh, that's a uh, wonderful question. And I might just piggyback on that to ask, um, now that you have brought the family together in all these letters, do they, what happens to the letters? Do they want them centralized? Oh yeah, right, that's a good question collected? too. Do they want them published? Do they each want to keep them under their mattresses for the rest of their lives? Right. Um, I did not record my interviews. Um, I'm thinking if that is consistently true. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not trained as a, a oral historian. I, I can't claim to adhere to all of the um, very nuanced and sophisticated um, norms of that field. Um, I didn't go through human subjects review. You know, many historians make that decision to not go through human subjects review for, for sets of reasons that, you know, we, we probably many of us know, although some do. I did seek legal um, permission anytime I used an oral history. Uh, and in some case, and when I used documents in private hands, but I didn't record, I think partly because, um, I don't know, an oral historian would, would definitely reject this, but there, so much of this, I, I recorded a couple of interviews, but so, so much of this was so um, personal and intimate. And I was, I think, a tiny bit uh, nervous about how that act of recording might change the nature of the interview. Um, in terms of the papers that remain in family hands, some of the families have already like proactively, even before my arrival on the scene, had promised them to an archive, one family I can think of, because they already were very connected to sort of history production. Um, another branch of the family, um, it remains in family hands and I, I have gently broached the topic of whether they might consider donating them to an archive. But I think it's very delicate, honestly. I think that um, as a historian, um, I despair at the thought of these items being damaged um, or disappearing or getting lost, you know, fire, insects, water, or whatever. I simply despair at that thought. On the other hand, I do believe they are the, they belong to the family. And I don't want them to feel um, pressured to release them. I do believe they are a kind of inheritance. I would love to see at least copies donated. Um, and it is something that I do uh, bring up with family members from time to time and always offer to help them if they want to make that choice. But I don't feel it's my job to um, push them to make that choice. We are um, at one o'clock and um, I want to thank you, Sarah, uh, first of all, for writing this book, which everybody thank should go out and buy if they haven't already. And to Maury for the wonderful questions um, and discussion and for all of you um, for, for joining us today. So thank you very much again. Sarah. Many thanks to you for the invitation and your engagement and good to see you. Good day, everyone. Bye, thank you. Bye, thanks.